So I, I'm going to tell you a few things that people who really know Yale uh, would know. Okay. Uh, the first thing that um, some some of us will know is that uh, Yale, according to Sanjay Patel, who's sitting over here, Yale is the uh, best known as Sanjay's advisor. Okay, so you know that, <laughs> that, that that's one thing you got to know, right? And but even though Sanjay would like to think so, but Yale is really best known as Amanda's godfather. So you know, for those of you who don't, who don't know Amanda, who Amanda is, you're really missing out big. So you're going to find out after the talk. The second one that you should know is that you should make yourself very, very comfortable. Yale is known to cover one slide with, uh, in an hour. And I peek into his file. He definitely has more than three slides. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another thing. But uh, I think uh, there are a couple of things I really want to say about Yale. Um, Yale is uh, probably the best known as what we call the, uh, the conscience of computer architecture. He's not afraid to, you know, to call it BS. He's not afraid to, you know, to, to, to say, well, you know, uh, these things are all very fashionable stuff, but uh, I'm not sure why you're doing this. So today, if you don't uh, uh, stop Yale and say, Hey, Yale, you know what, um, how about this? Or you say, you know what, Yale, you're saying this, but I don't agree with you. Then you're missing out. And that's the reason why you should make yourself very comfortable. You know, by 5 o'clock, I will try to stop the talk. But, um, you know, before that, you may as well make the most out of the time and get a couple of your own questions answered. So without further ado, Yale, thanks for coming. Okay. <laughs> I had never understood why people clap before a talk. You have no idea they're whether... They're clapping for me. Maybe. <laughs> oh, they're clapping for the introduction. That's good. And you, did leave me, and you did leave me five minutes for the talk. So that, that's, uh, that, that's also good. Uh, a couple of things. The, uh, the video guy is where? In the back? Over here. Oh, can you... So do you know that it's working? Yes. It is working. Okay. Yeah, if we had the mic on, it would just, uh, my voice tends to get louder and louder and louder, and uh, it would just not, uh, I'm, s I'm feeling an echo, is it, do you hear an echo, or is it just, just me, just me, echo, okay, maybe when I wake up it'll be better, is that going to work? <laughs> just that, in case you want it. I do want it, if it will work. <laughs> One of the, there's another thing, excuse me for doing this bookkeeping now, uh, does, does this plug in? It doesn't plug in, all right. Okay, and this thing uh, advances slides by hitting which uh, button? The, at the, the very top. The very top. These two, and one will advance it? No, this one will advance it. No, yes. And this will back it up. Okay, so it works. The problem is that uh, this is my cheat sheet, and the only reason it's here is to keep me somewhat on target, yeah. And I can't see it if it's sitting back there without looking at it instead of looking at you. And I much prefer, so this is, uh, ju this is, just, when this is just an ornament. No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, good. I got, so this year's award, uh, every year the students give me an award at the graduation. And as Sanjay cleverly did in an introduction years ago as to the professor who is most confused for being a bum by the police on campus. <laughs> Another one was for the professor who has sleeping habits most like a student. <laughs> and this year, and it really pissed me off, <laughs> to the professor who has been here 10 years and still can't master the uh, projection equipment. Right? <laughs> And most of them can, but I uh, have a problem. I wish this was bigger, too, because I don't want this to, uh, to spill over. So I'm not sure I'm going to work this. Usually I don't lecture from notes, but um, uh, I do uh, here. So you'll see me looking over this way. If you want to interrupt, please do. Um, for some of you, you're watching me do PowerPoint for the first time. I finally caved and... Uh, took the advice of everybody saying you must do PowerPoint. You can't do your, you know, you walk in with 10 transparencies and I get through two of them during an hour. Uh, I'm sorry? 
Who scanned them in for me? <laughs> Who scanned them in for me? That's very clever. <laughs> When I want your opinion, <laughs> I will give it to you. Uh, yeah, no. So uh, the the so Sanjay saw so, so Sanjay actually saw my PowerPoint, and he says you're incredible. You've taken this in, this rich technology known as PowerPoint and reduced it to overhead transparency. <laughs> so no, I do do these myself. The problem with, there's two problems with PowerPoint that I've discovered. I've been using PowerPoint all the time now. In, in, I don't in classroom. Classroom, you don't want to use PowerPoint. In fact, those of you that are professors, your lecture will be so much better if you will leave your, power, your laptop at home. And the, smart, the good students will tell you that if you can get them to be honest with you instead of telling you what they think you want to hear. But the blackboard or the whiteboard is three-dimensional. You know, you have the height of the blackboard, you have the width, and then you have time. And so you can build your lecture as you go while looking at the students. With PowerPoint, even though if you're very, very good at it, you can build, it takes an enormous amount of time to prepare a lecture. On PowerPoint, that is good lecture. I'm talking about lectures now teaching a class. So uh, for teaching, I, I would never use this nonsense. But unfortunately, I've got to get through a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. PowerPoint seems to be the answer. Uh, there are two problems with PowerPoint. So the first time I gave a PowerPoint talk, I came in with 10 of these slides. The second time I came in with 13, the 10 from the first one, and then I added three. What you do is you keep adding. You never subtract. And so the, the size of the lecture keeps growing. And that's problematic. And then the other thing is people won't interrupt PowerPoint. They, they sort of, they're in a zone. They're attending a presentation uh, rather than interacting in a, in a talk. So uh, feel free to interrupt. And uh, I don't even want to tell you how many slides there are here. I have uh, gotten to the point now where I, uh, I'm doing some Mickey Mouse animation by replicating slides. So it really is Mickey Mouse, but it means that the number of slides is larger. Anyway, so the title is Future Microprocessors, uh, multi-core, which you're probably sick of hearing multi-core. Uh, mega nonsense, because uh, there are too many people who don't get it, and uh, so they're promoting all this crap that's uh, just that. And then what must we do differently moving uh, forward? And the thing we must do differently is something I've been advocating for the last uh, 30 years, except now I think we have to do it. Okay, so uh, a little motivation at the, uh, uh, super, the European Supercomputing Conference last year. They invited me and a uh, Berkeley professor, I was supposed to do the hardware, she was going to do the software, and we were supposed to discuss this whole concept of multi-core. For This is Hans Moore's uh, conference. I'm going to be ignoring you guys, I guess, because I'm going to be facing so, you know, you can see that I'm starting to get bald or something. Uh, and so the guy who came up with the blurb to advertise this presentation, get the attendees to want to come to hear us, uh, talk, argue hopefully, it turns out that she's bright, Kathy Yellick, she's bright and we agreed on far more than we disagreed, uh, which was a pleasure also. Uh, but when he wrote up the blurb to announce the talk, he uh, said things like, uh, Moore's law in the future will mean doubling the number of transistors on a chip. Does that make any sense at all? So I guess it does if we keep the number of transistors in the core constant, and, uh, you know, no, no transistors used for interconnect. You know, the, the cores would just sit there and mentally telepathy to, to each other. And uh, so, you know, uh, I don't think so. And then he said, how will we effectively utilize a 10 million core <laughs> supercomputer, see? Actually, he didn't say, so I got that wrong. He, it was a 10 million core microprocessor, and I do need to correct that. Because otherwise, it doesn't, my, my next, uh, my bullet doesn't really work. 10 million cores on a chip. You see, the number of transistors on a chip is going to continue to grow. Gelsinger says we'll go down to 10 nanometers. 10 nanometers. Amazing. You know, it's uh, 100 angstroms. If you remember your high school chemistry when you learned the, the, what angstroms measure. Uh, we're getting to be pretty small. 
And as, the, uh, as lambda gets smaller and we increase the size of the chip, of course, the number can grow. And so Moore's law is alive and well for the foreseeable future. With 3D, it gets even longer into the future because now we can make effectively bigger and bigger chips. So we will have, they claim, with, the, with these technology things, 50 billion transistors on a chip. 50 billion. So with 50 billion transistors on a chip, you could actually do a 10 million core chip, say. And when I was about four years old, my father taught me how to do division. 50 billion divided by 10 million is what? 50 divided by 10 is five, and billion divided by million is thousand. So you'll have, and no interconnect, because we can't afford interconnect. It's just <laughs> cores on the chip. And so we'll have 5,000 transistors on each core. So the chip of the year 2020 will be 10 million Intel 4004s. You know? <laughs> but the problem is that you, know, you, you think a core on a chip, and then dual core, and then quad core, and then octa core, and Larrabee has 32 cores. And, you know, the number, so once you start getting a big number and you have no idea how to deal with it, but that's a software problem. Let them worry about that. <laughs> so, you know. so then, and in fact, there was a panel uh, that I was, I actually, were you there at IPDPS when I was in the panel from the audience? Yeah, you, you were there. That's right. And uh, the panel was, what do we do with a thousand cores? We have no idea what we do with a thousand cores. Uh, GPUs accepted, of course. Uh, but once you get the number big enough, what the hell? A thousand, a million, ten million, say. It's all nonsense. Right? 10 million cores. But it makes a good sound bite and it, it sort of, you know, energizes people. Oh, wow! And nobody stops to say, uh, and I hope that was a typo. Actually, <laughs> it was. I said supercomputer and I meant to say microprocessor and do the math. 50 billion divided by 10 million. Uh, a couple other things he said which I want to say in passing. Will the chip be homogeneous or heterogeneous? If you listen to the companies, they'll all say homogeneous. The right answer is heterogeneous. They're starting to come around, except that homogeneous is so much easier to do, so much cheaper to build, that uh, you don't get that publicly. But as I understand it, I'm not non-disclosed to these companies, but I do go out for beer with them, and sometimes they have a few too many, and so they tell me that, yeah, deep down they are looking at heterogeneous. You have to. You know. uh, I don't care how good your quarterback is, you wouldn't want to have 11 quarterbacks on the field <laughs> at, at one time, right? Specially tailored parts, and that's what heterogeneity is all about, and we'll see more on that later. Uh, it's what I've been calling for a long time now, Pentium X Niagara Y, where Pentium X means the X, so like Pentium 10 or Pentium 25 or something. It's the nth generation of Pentium with all the bells and whistles, the heavy lifting uh, core, and then Niagara Y, the other extreme, where the idea is get as many cores on the chip to do as much in parallel as, uh, as we have available, and we don't care about the, uh, the latency uh, for any instruction in any core. We win on throughput. So problems tend to have both parts, and having both on the chip, uh, I believe, is the chip of the future. And I think finally uh, some of these companies are starting to come around. The cell processor, by the way, is not an example of this. Right? The cell processor, the PowerPC core on that chip is not a heavyweight core. It's just there to run the operating system rather than have to design something new and write new code. Uh, they just could lift it and get all the OS code to, to, to work. So the concept of one and many, the one should be the heavyweight, the heavy hitter. The many should be for doing the, the throughput. And a couple other things, uh, should, uh, there, will there be a standard ISA like the x86? And the answer is who cares? You know, whatever that front end is, ISA is, ISA is just a, uh, it's a contract, it's a pact. It's the interface between what the software produces, what the hardware has to, has to uh, deliver. And what that interface is, is almost irrelevant. We can make, we can do good things with that interface by allowing, as we'll see later on, allow the compiler person to know about the microarchitecture and the microarchitecture to, uh, to deal with what the compiler produces. But as far as the format and everything, uh, the ISA is, is just an interface and we decode and once we've decoded, we, uh, it, it doesn't matter. 
And the other thing, was, my other hot button, he said, was, are there any good tools for automatically generating parallel programs? And what I don't understand is why this automatic, why this preoccupation with the tool has to be automatic, you know? Uh, computers do certain things good, and we do certain things good, and if we can harness the both of them together, then aren't we better off than trying to force fit automatic into everything. Anyway, so what I want to do today is, given all the multi-core hype that we've been hearing, uh, you know, uh, is it really the holy grail? Uh, in fact, it's coming across like a religious thing almost, uh, with cure cancer. <laughs> so. Uh, what is multi-core and what is it not and what we must do differently moving forward if we want a microprocessor 10 years from now that will deliver the performance that Moore's Law is going to continue to deliver for another 10 years. Uh, so here's the compile time outline, never to be confused with the runtime outline. <laughs> okay. You know, it's such a pleasure to be at Illinois. I don't have to explain what I meant by that, you know, everybody, <laughs> you would be amazed at how many places I have to explain what I just said. Anyway, <laughs> so this is the compile time outline and uh, what the runtime outline is, we'll see. So first of all, multi-core, how we got there. And so it's all about Moore's Law and the first microprocessor, you know. Uh, 1971, 2300 transistors, 100 kilohertz. And then you forward 20 years and you got the, uh, the Pentium chip, 3 million transistors. In fact, uh, ah, I haven't picked on you in a long time. Do you know what this is? No. You don't know what this is? Really? I have to teach you? It's a processor. No, 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 it's a keychain. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a... Uh, so Intel wants to insist that their fab is 100% yield, say. And the way they get that is some of the chips go in a process, into uh, laptops and some of them go into keychains. And they get 100% they get, they get yield, say. And then today we have more than a billion on a chip. Uh, what was I reading? The N NVIDIA chip is 3 billion already. Uh, so it keeps on going and the frequencies keep going and... So uh, what happens tomorrow, we don't know. Uh, so there's a slide I did not make up, uh, Steve. This, uh, you clearly, I did not make up this slide, right? This was done by one of my students. Uh, I did the title, so you can see that the, the title, the font of the title is attractive, but the font of the, ugh. Uh, so I really should fix that. I said I don't have a clue how to. I guess the only way is to tell them to do it right. So this is uh, starting with the first microprocessor, which, which is all processor. There's no cache on that chip. Um, in fact, the first cache didn't come out till when? Like 1984, 85, the Motorola 68020, with 256 bytes of iCache on that chip. But as time has gone by, uh, the number of transistors on the chip has continued to double every time interval. That's what Moore's Law is all about. Every time interval, it doubles. You all know what that time interval is, by the way, right? Oh, wrong. Who said 18 months? Shame on you. I have to teach you something. No. <laughs> Gordon Moore never said 18 months. Read the history. Read the paper. Gordon Moore in 1965, pro projecting out in the future, and he plotted this on semi-log paper and got a straight line. Semi-log paper, straight line is an exponential, as you know. And the slope of that line will tell you how often the doubling is. And what was it? Every year. Right? Every year. And then 10 years later, in 1975, he projected out again. And this time, when he projected out, the points on the straight line, again, the slope was <coughs> smaller every two years. Right? So in 1965, he said every year. In 1975, he, this is true. He said every two years. But, you know, this is America. We can't be bothered with such a long story. So one year, two year, one plus two equals three, divided by two is 18 months. <laughs> and so everybody knows the law is 18 months. Gordon never said 18 months. Anyway, you'll notice that the number of transistors on the chip does go up, except there's this cache happening. And as time goes by, more and more transistors go into the cache, the L2 cache. In fact, the first Pentium M chip, 77 million transistors, 
50 million went into the L2 cash. The next generation of the Pentium M chip comes out of Haifa, Israel, design center, the Israeli, Intel Israeli design center. 77 million, 50 million. Next chip, 140 million transistors. So you go from 77 million to 140 million. The L2 cash, from 50 million to 110 million. Okay. So you see what's going on. Most of the transistors go into the L2 cash. At some point it gets ridiculous. I don't know how many of you are dog people. It's like when you have a puppy, you know, and the, the puppy is this big, but the forearms are huge if the puppy's going to grow. It's a funny looking dog. The good news is the puppy will grow. The bad news is that this looks funny even years later. And so it gets so embarrassing that they say, you know, we can't sell a chip like this. And so, and we can't put the transistors into the core because that's hard. Coming out with a better branch predictor or a trace cache that actually works, you know, putting replay on the chip. And for those of you that don't know what replay is, I got a reference for you that you need to study. And so what do they do? Put another core in the chip. Now it looks good. But time goes on. Notice Moore's law, number of transistors on a chip. What do you suppose they do then? Right. <laughs> so uh, here's a Penny Mem chip. And I asked my student to do the following. I said, okay, so here's the chip. And, uh, you know, the number of transistors goes up and up and up and up. And it looks really silly. So what does Intel do? Bingo, see? And if we look at the micrographs of most of these chips, you'll see, you know, that the L2 cache is, dominates the chip. So why multi-core chips? In the beginning, it was for better and better uniprocess. The first chips didn't have, there was nothing on the first chip. There's just the functionality of processing the instructions. And then, you know, we, uh, we got pipelining, and once we got pipelining, we did branch prediction, and uh, once we got branch prediction, if we could do out of order, we could do speculative execution, and it just goes on and on as we uh, enhance the, uh, the microprocessor. But as the number of transistors keeps going uh, up, uh, this improvement of the performance and the hard problems got too hard, and so finally we just said, screw it, a bigger and bigger L2 cache. Stopping the improvement of the hard problems. Poorly utilizing the chip area. You make the L2 cache bigger and bigger and bigger, you'll get fewer cache misses. You'll get 5% improvement in performance. Problem, of course, is that then you blame the core because even though you didn't give it any transistors to do the job, you then blame it because, look, there's twice as many transistors in the chip. How come you get 5% improvement in performance? Because you didn't give me the transistors, you put it into the L2 cache and you get 5% because you get a better cache hit ratio. And blaming the process for not delivering. Today we have dual core, our quad core, et cetera, with tomorrow. Why multi-core? It's easier, it's cheaper, certainly cheaper. You don't have to uh, do all this complicated design. Uh, I would argue what was embarrassing to continue to make the L2 bigger, it was the next obvious step. So what's the point? Uh, multi-core is here. In fact, with all the buzz, there's uh, no getting around it. Multi-core is a reality. And why is this not working? Uh, we will have we will have a thousand core chips. I think that's, that's no question about that. It was not a technological improvement. It was the obvious next thing to do. Therefore, we don't have to accept it as it is. We can get it right next time, and uh, that means what? Figuring out what goes on the chip and figuring out what the interfaces are, and that's important also. What are the interfaces to the software to this chip? So. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time on my, what I call mega nonsense. It's uh, stuff that comes out of the mouths of people who should know better. These are people who never got a degree at Illinois. I will vouch for that. In fact, that's, that's fascinating, you know, that uh, they need to come here to learn, you know, to understand in, in a deep way. And uh, these are people that were trained uh, elsewhere. And, if I tell you where, it may give you a clue as to who, and I have agreed that I'm going to stop doing that. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, mega nonsense. So multi-core was the solution to a performance problem, so I've already dealt with that. Uh, hardware works sequentially. This came out of his mouth. In fact, you were in the audience when he said this, I think, and I can believe it. Hardware works sequentially. 
Now it's true that hardware works cycle by cycle, and that is sequential. But in the context of talking about hardware in parallel and software in parallel and saying programming in the reason why this thing comes up is because programming in parallel. Well, programs actually also work cycle by cycle, except what we want to try to do with the software is get this, this program which does go cycle by cycle to also in any one cycle to work in parallel. Well, it turns out hardware is, I mean, the default is parallel. All the electron, for hard, those of you that are hardware people, you know this, every electron on the chip is working all the time. It is not the case that this electron says, uh, after you, Mr. Electron. <laughs> and this electron says, oh, no, 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 you're the older electron. You go first. <laughs> if you want to do things sequentially in a hardware description language, you have to, you have to do a, a construct, like next. Like, <laughs> you know, like you do all this in parallel. <laughs> now you do all this in parallel. Hardware is, it's parallel. You know, it's, it's totally parallel. It's true, the hardware goes cycle by cycle, but that's not the essence of the idea. Now, they tell me software is harder, and so I'll believe them, but don't tell me that hardware uh, works sequentially. It works concurrently. The other thing is make the hardware simple. I can't believe this. The notion that, you know, with all these transistors, we're going to be able to get far more of these Mickey Mouse cores which is going to exacerbate the, um, you know, the software uh, problem. In fact, uh, for this one, I've got a little bit of uh, backup. Uh, this is the work that uh, Arthur Suleiman, and uh, we've been publishing this for the last couple of years. There will be an ISCA paper on one of the problems in, involved with this. And the idea is that uh, on the left, you see the, the uh, you know, the core duo, the quad core, the, the, the default thing coming out of these companies where you have more than one core, and they're all the same, and they're all heavyweight. Right? So like we call that the tile large approach. And then in the middle is the Niagara approach, which is no heavyweight core, but lots of Mickey Mouse cores. And then our approach, and for, this, uh, for purposes of illustration, uh, in fact, a lot of the original simulations is with, uh, six, with, a, with the area to do 16 cores. And so the heavyweight core will take up the space of four of the Mickey Mouse cores. And when I say heavyweight versus lightweight, uh, I'm, I'm serious. I'm not talking about just having a bigger cache. So out of order versus in order and wide, wider fetch versus narrower fetch and a better branch predictor and a deeper pipeline and uh, more functional units and anything else you want, everything but the kitchen sink, as opposed to the small core that's streamlined and uh, doesn't take up much area at all. And in fact, we arbitrarily say, okay, so the large core can run twice the speed of the small core. <coughs> and so this is uh, the theoretical, the analytic analysis of uh, the, th the three approaches. And it's for the previous thing where I have 16, uh, I have space area for 16 cores, and tile large is four big ones, and tile small is 16 small ones, and ACMP is one big one and uh, 12 small ones. And you'll notice that... Uh, uh, so this is a factor of two if, it's, if the parallelizability is zero, which makes sense. You're only keeping one core busy. It's not until you get way out to like 97% parallelizability where the Niagara approach uh, does better than the one large versus the tw uh, one large and 12 small versus 16 small. Because as you get better than 97%, then the fact you've got 16 running throughput gives you an edge over 12 plus the big core, uh, giving you throughput. As the number of cores on a chip goes up, this crossover point gets closer to 1. Because the amount of area that's going to be consumed by the large core becomes a smaller fraction of the, of the total uh, area. So you know the, sorry, the x-axis is a fraction of your core that can run in. I'm sorry? The x-axis is the fraction of your code that can run infinitely parallel or the, or the fraction of your parallel? Yeah, right. So, the, uh, so th that's right. So it's an analytic model that's built in the assumption that, yes, there are no critical sections. There's, uh, yeah, it's uh, strictly the, it's Amdahl, so it's the assumptions of Amdahl's law taken to uh, this model. And, uh, yeah. Okay.
Uh, do in parallel to slower clock and save power. I don't even think I'm going to touch this one because I think that's been overbeaten. Everybody knows about the cube law, so if you run it half the frequency, it takes one eighth the power. In fact, I, if you guys want a way to get an undergraduate degree in uh, you know, two years rather than four years, they're telling you it takes four years, and they're you know they're they're assuming that you take the second course after the first course. That is, the prerequisite has to be taken before the follow-on. See, but if you didn't obey a prerequisite structure, you just take them all together. You know, so then you could get out in a couple of years. What keeps you here for four years is the prerequisite chain, right? So what am I trying to say? That, yeah, there are applications that, ha that are embarrassingly parallel. In fact, uh, you guys work on one of them in graphics, so there'll be a little bit on that that we'll, we'll mention. But there's a hell of a lot of stuff out there that doesn't admit taking this thread and breaking it up into pieces and running them in parallel. You know, there's the... Uh, do I do the that uh, the woman thing, or am I uh, am I offending the females in the room? <laughs> Apparently, I'm offending the elephants. So I did the elephants, but that didn't help. It, it turns out that still offended a couple okay, of the women. Don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. Uh, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then I won't do it. It might have been offensive to ask you. Huh? It might have been offensive to ask. It might have been offensive <laughs> to ask. Okay. So I won't do it. I'll just skip it. Fine. ILP is dead. I keep hearing this all the time. You know, ILP is dead. I've already given you a hint about this, that we don't invest the transistors into the core, and yet we blame the, the core for not delivering performance. We say ILP is dead. ILP is not dead. Uh, it'll be dead if we don't pay attention to it. Uh, ILP is dead. So here this. I told you this already. I gave you these numbers. I gave you these numbers. And I mentioned that the improvement in performance is because of the, the transistors invested in the L2 cache, and therefore ILP is dead. Uh, so there's an example. So Digital Equipment Corporation, before they you know, folded into Compaq and then folded into, uh, uh, well, most of it was HP, but this part was Intel. I'm waiting for HP to fold into IBM, so there may be one big company. Anyway, EV4. EV4 was the code, EV was the code name for the alpha chip, which followed the VAX, so extended VAX. It's the next ISA after the VAX. And the first one they produced, EV4, the 21064. And uh, it had a certain amount of performance to it. And then EV5, uh, the 21164, 21264. And they, the design all the way up to EV8 was done and simulated. And if you look at the numbers, and this is a paper, uh, published by one of the DEC people, and it showed that the performance improvement from EV4 to EV8 was 55x. So a lot of people keep telling you all the time, you know, that, yeah, that's because the transistors got smaller, the switching time gets faster, and it's because of frequency that we get all that. So you step back and you say, okay, 55x. And what is the improvement in frequency? 7x. So then you remember, you know, my father taught me how to divide. So 55 divided by 7 is bigger than 7. Meaning that more performance comes out of the microarchitecture than came out of the frequency. So this nonsense you keep hearing, ILP, it was all about the frequency. And I keep hearing, you know, the people talking about multi-core, the first thing they do when they're talking, they're in preface and their comments is, ILP is dead. It's all about frequency. Wrong. In fact, if you look at these, uh, these alpha chips, you know, EV4 was what? Two-wide issue, two-wide issue. In-order processing, Mickey Mouse branch predictor, the simplest of all the dynamic branch predictors, last time taken. Now you go to EV5, the next generation. The two-wide issue becomes four-wide issue. In-order stays in-order. Branch predictor graduates to the saturating two-bit counter. Now you go to EV6, 21264. Still got the four wide issue, but now you go out of order. Instead of the two bit counter, now you got the a hybrid uh, two level branch predictor. These things contribute. And so as time, yeah. I, I wonder if these numbers are slightly misleading because uh, if you consider EV8. I'm EV8, sorry? Uh, if you consider EV8, EV8 was a four threaded SMT processor. 
So again, if we are doing background calculations, uh, if you are getting throughput improvements because of thread level parallelism, so let's say it's four because of that. So that's seven x times four. So, so essentially, if you map, if you convert EV8 into a single thread processor, and then assume that they are running at the same technology as EV4, you wouldn't see. A, this is a study that. You know that? Done. Okay. They, I'm getting a. Uh, can you hear the? My, the. Repeat the question. No, no, no. What? So repeat the question for the video. So I will repeat the question, but first of all, I'm hearing my voice coming across the speakers. <laughs> Are you hearing my voice coming across the speakers? I think they turned the speaker up. I mean, the, the so mic. who turned the speaker up? No, not they turned the mic uh, sensitive. So whatever it is, I don't care what it is, you know. I become a object-oriented person, so it's you know, <laughs> Can we deal with yeah. it? Yeah, I think we just did. So his uh, comment is that my uh, analysis is uh, incorrect and he knows the problem better than I, which is uh, to, he's to be complimented. So I, let me first give his question. He's saying that my analysis is not fair because the, the 55x, and I don't know that that's true, but if you tell me it's true, then I'll believe you. I don't think that was in the paper. I think the paper was talking about the performance of a single thread, but I could be wrong. Okay, so I will defer to you if you know better. But his comment was that if the 55X represents the performance of a chip that has four threads that can be active at any time, then part of the performance benefit is due to thread level parallelism rather than instruction level parallelism, and then my analysis is not fair. Is that a reasonable statement yeah, of your? Fair well, okay, yeah. So I'm under the impression that the number is a single thread. I need to go back and read the paper. If you know it's not, then I will defer to you. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty confident about my number. Okay, so then we will, we will check it out. And the next time I give the talk, I will change the... So you're telling me that the 55 would become what if... Uh, so if you consider... No, no, I don't want a long answer, right? <laughs> because I'm running out of time. Let me just pose a simple question. If I had a single uh, thread running, the 50 on the EV8, this 55x would become what? Uh, 2.5 times 7. Two, ah, so you're telling me only 2.5 times uh, due to the microarchitecture. Okay, so that has to be checked out. Thank you. Uh, in which case, my argument that more comes from the microarchitecture is invalid, but my argument that it's not just a frequency is still valid. And it might be, actually, that by the time they got the EV8, they started putting less energy into a how do I make... See, one of the problems with thread-level parallelism is that it gives you a mindset that you're not going to be able to get anything out of a ILP anymore. Don't pay any attention to it. Right? And if you don't pay any attention to it, then it'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. Uh, so I do have a, uh, a data slide. If I had too many data slides, you'd think that I was a candidate for assistant professorship here. And if I had no data slides, you'd think that I was uh, a dean or something or other. So I do have that. <laughs> and uh, Steve, that's right. This was done by one of my students. That's right. <laughs> it shows for a number of benchmarks uh, what happens if you have a real cache and a real branch predictor. And what happens if you have a perfect cache and a perfect branch predictor? And the point is, there's a lot of headroom uh, if we will pay attention to a better branch predictor. If you go to industry, they'll tell you that uh, going from 98% accurate to 99% accurate is a big deal on branch prediction. It's not the accuracy, it's the inaccuracy. It's taking the misprediction penalty 2% of the time versus 1% of the time, which ends up doubling uh, performance. So that even though we are doing branch prediction very, very well, that we're getting closer to 100%, that little bit that's left over, we're not going to get 100% clearly, but the closer we get to it, uh, the bigger the payoff. But we never will if we don't put energy into it. Okay. Uh, the, I'm not going to go through this in any great detail. Uh, other than to ask, Moore's Law is a law of what? Physics, <coughs> process technology, microarchitecture? or psychology? There's only one right answer. Psychology. Psychology, absolutely. 
Uh, the reason why Moore's Law works is because the process people uh, don't know that no, don't know any better. They don't know that it can't work. Right? They continue to work and push the envelope. And I wish my colleagues in computer architecture would do the same thing instead of saying, oh, everything has been done, has been done. Uh, one of my favorite entertainers was um, uh, uh, Simi Davis Jr. And you look, at it, you look at him and you say, how could this guy be a great, you know, he limped and he was ugly and... Uh, but he was the world's greatest entertainer you know, for a long time, for a period of time. And he wrote an autobiography. And what was the title? Yes, I Can. Okay. And that's what I'm trying to uh, imbue, instill in you. Yes, I Can. Okay. So uh, mega nonsense, ILP is dead. Examine what is rather than what can be. So looking at old programs and say, okay, here's the code. And what should we speed up on the chip in order to accommodate this old code? Uh, and there are groups that do this and say, we will look at the, at the programs and determine how to design the next chip based on what's in the program. And so I would say it's more important to examine what is rather than what can be. Uh, and uh, the East River example in New York, the city of New York, I don't know how many of you know New York, but we've got this island called Manhattan, we've got Queens and Brooklyn, and People live in Brooklyn and Queens because it's cheaper, but they work in Manhattan, so they have to go across the bridge all day. And those two bridges, the Triborough Bridge and the 59th Street Bridge, are constantly congested. And so the city of New York says, what are you going to do about this? So they hired IBM, big corporation, a lot of systems analysis uh, in New York. IBM's headquarters are just a little bit north of New York. Said, could you tell us what to do? Should we put in another bridge halfway between 59th Street and the Triborough Bridge? And so these guys, they said, okay, let's go out there and check it out. So they, uh, they went to Manhattan, they uh, rented a rowboat, and they put the rowboat halfway between the two bridges, and they sat there all day. Then they came back to the city of New York, and they said, you don't need a bridge. We sat there all day, and not even one car tried to cross the East River halfway <laughs> between the, the two bridges. So you don't want to look at the code, you want to look at the algorithms. You want to look at the problems. You want to look higher up to determine what you need to build uh, into the chip. Uh, uh, communication, off-chip is hard, on-chip is easy. Yeah, on-chip is not easy anymore. The latency on-chip, you better be doing near, nearest neighbor, the frequencies we're running at. No, on-chip is not easy. Abstraction is a pure good. I get this all the time, the object-oriented object people. Abstraction is a pure good. Can abstractions lead to trouble? So uh, I was in Manhattan. And I wanted to go to the airport. I was in the financial district, and I get into a cab, and I say, LaGuardia. LaGuardia, four syllables. What could be a higher level of abstraction than that? And the cabbie takes me up the, over the Triborough and down, and uh, I say, why do we go through the Midtown Tunnel, which is right there? So, oh, I know what I'm doing. You know, zoo. Abstraction is great as long as everything below you works fine. If something doesn't work fine, if you don't know what is underneath, then you are at the mercy of whatever is underneath. Uh, the scheme chip at MIT. Uh, when the VLSI stuff started, the, the, the meeting Conway method, you know, green, red, must be a transistor. You can design a chip without having any clue of what the electrical properties of a transistor is. Small <coughs> signal models, forget it. You know, just green, red, must be a transistor. And so at MIT they decided, ah, why don't we use this and we'll implement a chip to run Scheme. Didn't work. Didn't work. So they said, wait a minute, we know what the hell we're doing. We're MIT engineers. We understand small signal models. They went, and knowing their engineering background, they went and redesigned the chip and it did work because they knew what was going on underneath. Uh, sorting. I uh, talked to a typical CS graduate. I don't know how many of them I have in the room. But uh, you asked the question, uh, does the sorting, uh, does, does, does your choice of sorting algorithm matter uh, depending on whether all the data can fit in memory or whether you have to bring it back and forth from the disk? And the typical answer you get, I guess the typical answer is what's a disk, but, uh, <laughs> but you take the next step and they'll say, no, I guess it doesn't matter because they're doing sorting at this higher level, well, of course it matters. And if you read the 300 pages of Knuth Volume 3, 
you'll see there are internal sorts and external sorts, and it does matter uh, whether or not you can fit all the data in it. In fact, uh, you know, now we might say, can you fit all the data in the L2 cache? In fact, Jim Gray had a good analysis where uh, he showed what a big difference it makes. So another example of not understanding below. Uh, my freshman course, which uh, I should say uh, Professor Patel and my, our freshman course, which is also taught here. And at this point, we're now 15 years later, and there are a lot of Microsoft developers that started with that freshman course. And I keep getting email all the time. Thank you for the freshman course, because we understood right from the get-go how the computer worked. And understanding how the computer worked, even though they don't design computers, they write code. But this, the fact that they've grokked what goes on with the computer makes them a better uh, software person. Right? A deeper understanding of the problem if they understand what's below the surface. Okay, so abstractions are pure good. Programmers are all dumb and need to be protected. Uh, so I have a few words on that later on. Thinking in parallel is hard. That's another thing you get. Thinking in parallel is hard. Thinking in parallel is hard. <laughs> So I'll give you a little secret. If you're running late and you want to know whether everybody is still awake or whether they're sound asleep, you do something like that. If you get no reaction, you may as well end the class right there. <laughs> end the lecture right there because if they don't find that funny, then, oh, they may not find it funny. That's certainly true. <laughs> but, uh, so you prove to me that you're still paying attention. And that's great. How do we get people to believe that thinking in parallel is natural? Okay, so that's the mega nonsense that I'm suffering from. And then the question is, what do we got to do differently? The process technology will give us 50 billion transistors. I've already told you that. The dreamers will do whatever we provide. So the dreamers are the people working with the, uh, on the problem. And uh, they won't even look at problems unless we have something that can actually deliver. So they're not going to try, if they have a, a, a program that will predict the weather, and if you run it on our chips, you get the weather prediction for tomorrow, a week from Sunday. That doesn't help. You can just wait till tomorrow and look out the window. Okay? <laughs> so if you want a weather prediction program that's going to be useful, it's got to get it done in time to now know what tomorrow's weather is. Okay? So the dreamers, the, the dreamers aren't us. The dreamers are these people with these problems, these application people. I don't care whether they're in biology or physics. They, you know, that you're working with lately or what, but they're, they're application people and they will use what we give them. And so what we need to pay attention to is what will be on the chip and what will the interfaces be? How will we use 50 billion transistors? The temptation, as we've seen in most of the industry, is to step the reticle. The core, 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 that's easy. And continue the business as usual. And then you get the comment that the number of cores doubles every you know, interval of time. But has it worked? Why haven't we seen comparable benefit? Now we have, sort of, in two cases. GPUs, if there's no divergence. Now, database, if there's no critical sections. But there is divergence and there is critical sections and if you look at what goes on in the NVIDIA chips, in fact, what do they do with the programmers? They say, write your code so that you don't get branches because branches causes, so I don't know how many of you GPU happy. So you've got a huge number of cores that will run in SIMD. And what you'd like to do is have the same code running on different data concurrently. And it does. Instruction, they all do it. Instruction is standard SIMD. Now you get a branch. Diverge. Now you stop doing this and work on this. We get done with that, you go back and now you work on this. Right? Because that's the the, that's the nature of the beast, the nature of the microarchitecture. But, uh, so how do they solve it? They say, don't use branches. Try to write your code so the number of branches are uh, minimal or that they always go the same way. In fact, going to the software, that's kind of good. In fact, uh, you, for example, uh, has shown, in fact, the... the, the, the the power of what Professor Hu showed is enormous. That it matters whether you have an array of structures or a structure of arrays. You can program it either way. You program it one way, bleh. you program it the other way, you can make the thing run hell, like, like hell. So, in fact, I have a student right now that's working on how do I redesign the GPU so that the divergence doesn't bite you in the butt. 
And critical sections, of course, you all know what that does. So in my opinion, the reason why we haven't seen the performance is our inability to exploit the transformation hierarchy and parallel programming. Here's a transformation hierarchy, which I came up with about 30 years ago, and it's been uh, uh, you know, replicated by many people many times. You've got problems at the top. You get electrons at the problem, bottom. Only the electrons are really solving the problem. Everything else is just uh, an abstraction, if you will. If we could do a global optimum, we could take the problem, and if the electrons could speak English, I could go up to the electrons and say, electrons, you know, <laughs> do this problem. I can't speak electrons, or if they could speak English. So what I do is a sequence of local transformations, which is not as good. The problem is that everybody works within their layer. Now, Professor Hu has, has bridged that layer. He understands compilers. In fact, he's done some of the best work in compilers. He also understands microarchitecture. He's one of the first people to, uh, to uh, show that, in fact, his thesis, some of you probably don't know this, but his thesis was a critical part of why chips do out-of-order execution. He said, out-of-order execution is fine, all well and good. Thomas Sewell algorithm did that in the mid-60s. But if you don't maintain precise exceptions, nobody's going to use it. So that's what his thesis did. Now, his thesis did a lot of things, but the central core, I would argue, in his thesis was that, you know, out-of-order execution is fine, but you better be able to retire the instructions in order. And once we did that, of course, the bandwagon happened and, you know, all hell broke loose. But he's an exception. Most people work within their layer. Algorithms person, don't bother me about the microarchitecture. So the problem is that we have this transformation hierarchy, we haven't been able to exploit it. We're all working in our own layer. And up to now, we've maintained those artificial layers. We keep the abstraction secure, which makes for better comfort zone. In the beginning, the transistors, some of them were used for the microarchitecture. And then doubling the number of cores. And today, we have too many transistors in bandwidth and power kill us. And so we've got to change the paradigm. And so here's the major message is, what's the paradigm? Break the layers. We've already done it in limited cases, the compiler and the microarchitecture, limited cases. Predication is a good example of that. Uh, pragmas in the language, which a lot of language people, compiler people don't like. They say, well, you know, you can't give hints. I've never understood that one. Why would you want to have the compiler's hands tied behind its back? Give hints is good. Uh, the refrigerator. So uh, most of you were not here for my last talk here, which was, what, almost 10 years ago. And you've heard me say the refrigerator many times. You know where I came up with the refrigerator example? It was right here. No, no, it was right here. It was right here. Not in this room, wherever the room was. I don't remember. But it was at U of I where the kid asked a question and the answer was the refrigerator. The refrigerator is not uh, some, a, a, a unit in your kitchen. Uh, the refrigerator is a nickname for a football player. Now, I understand the University of Illinois doesn't play football. <laughs> In fact, Professor Hu in a piano many years ago allowed is the reason they don't play football is that they're more interested in scholarship, they, except you play basketball, so I'm not sure that that argument uh, uh, weighs. Anyway, the, 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 uh, the refrigerator was an NFL player, and uh, he was a defensive player for... Chicago Bears. Chicago Bears. His name was? Mike Perry. William Perry. William Perry. That's close. Mike Perry. No, William Perry. And uh, he was a defensive player. And the American game of football, unlike the, so some of you are international students, so when you say football, you think of this game that we call soccer. But this is America, where, <laughs> where the key word in America is unions. Say. So a football player in America only has to play offense or defense. Half the game, he gets to sit on the bench. The European game of football, you have to play the whole game. You don't have the labor. <laughs> game. So William Perry sat on the bench when the offense was on the field except if the Bears were on the one-foot line, at which point they would bring William Perry into the game, point him toward the goal line, handle the ball. One foot, he would score. Okay. Fantastic. One foot. He would score with half of the other team hanging over him. Okay. <laughs> Five yards, he'd never make it. Okay. One foot, he'd always make it. So William Perry was a defensive tackle for the Chicago Bears. That when the offense was on the field, he was sitting on the bench. Powered off. Powered off, and that's critical. Leakage current kills us these days. So powered off is important. 
But when they're on the one foot line, they bring him in and he scores. <coughs> William Perry, the refrigerator, is what we now call accelerators. It's a large piece of functionality that can sit on the chip doing nothing, if you got the interconnection structure right, except when you need it. But when you need it, you really need it. And so if, in fact, the algorithm people would tell the microarchitects what they need, and the microarchitects would tell the algorithm people what they can build, and then the ISA has the interface which marries the two, then we've broken the layers and we can get a win in performance. The, uh, first, one of the first risk chips, whatever they were, uh, the AMD 29000, had an instruction in there called find first. The find first instruction took a bit vector and found the first bit that was set. Try to do that in software. You know, you check a bit, it's a zero, okay. Check the next bit, to zero, bloop, until finally you find a bit that's set. So if you look at the code to run that thing, it's going to take you tens of cycles. How about if we do it in hardware, which is what the AMD 29000 did. They had this instruction, find first. You got a bit vector and you want to find the first bit that is set. Now if you've taken the sophomore logic design course and you did the homework assignment, you know that the answer is quite trivial. It's a priority encoder takes very few gates, and it'll do the job in a fraction of a cycle. Why did AMD stick it into the ISA? Because there are a lot of algorithms, and in, in, in addition some operating system functionality, that can make good use of it. So when it's not being used, it's sitting there just minding its own business. When it is being used, then it's there. Now in those days, we didn't worry about leakage current. You know, in those days, you had the source and the drain like this. Now we got the source and the drain like this, so we have to worry about it. So power off uh, becomes important. Uh, okay, I need to move on. Uh, this shows a number of the operators. If we will only break the layers, if the compiler people talk to the microarchitecture, and there's a lot of good things we can do, if the algorithm and compiler microarchitecture talk together. By the way, some of you are electrical engineers, the circuit people. You're running at frequencies now where every chip is going to have to be a fault tolerant chip. Bits do get flipped because of the frequencies. So we have to bring that into the design. Uh, how about verification hooks so that we can actually uh, determine that, yeah, what we built actually does what it's supposed to do. Well, if the microarchitects talk to the circuit designers, maybe we can get that one right. When Intel discovers that it, the ver a bug that it didn't verify late in the game, it's a very expensive uh, item. So lots of opportunities if we can get them to talk together. This piano I mentioned at, I at IPDPS, one by one, I saw I, I, from the audience, I brought this thing up. One by one, the panelists said, you'll never get an algorithm person to talk to an architect. It just will never happen. I say, that may be true. But if it's true, then I think we're in trouble. That moving forward, to take advantage of all these transistors, we need to have this uh, break the layers and uh, uh, communicate between. So the problem is that we train computer people to work within their comfort zone. Too few understand anything outside, and as far as multiple cores, people think sequential. What can we do? First, this parallel programming thing. Don't accept the premise that it's hard. So I teach the freshman course, uh, and uh, what I, uh, uh, so I've got what? 400 students in a freshman course. I don't teach it every year, but I teach it every other year, and I taught it this past fall. And the last lecture, what I did is I said, you know, you've heard maybe even reading ads about uh, multi-core or parallel processing. I say, uh, 10 factorial. You guys understand factorial? Of course they do. You know, the University of Texas freshmen. In fact, I'll bet the University of Illinois freshmen understand factorial also. So I said, supposing the major item is the multiply time. How many, so there's multiply time, one unit to do a multiply. Everything else doesn't matter. How many units to do 10 factorial? Just like that. 10 times 9, times 8, times 7, times 6, times 5, times 4, times 3, times 2. You don't need to multiply by 1 because that doesn't provide any benefit. <laughs> eight, 8 multiply times, 8 units of time. I said, ah, how about if you have two cores and you can pass work between the other? Now how many? Now, these kids haven't been taught that parallel programming is hard. And I realize I'm simplifying it with a nice simple example, but the point is that if you don't tell them it's hard, maybe there's a chance. And I gave them a minute to think. Half the class got it right. 
say, ah, I said, well, tell me more. So the kid says, five. I said, five, where'd you get five? He says, well, what I would do would I be say to him, you give me five factorial. And while he's doing that, I would do 10 times nine times eight times seven times six. That's four multiplied times. By then, five factorial is done, five multiplied times. Simple application, simple example, but the point is that they never, the kids don't think, so when you think factorial, you think of this sequential algorithm. That's a natural way to think about it. But you step back, you say, wait a minute, I got two cores. Can I make use of that factor? And so I've got factorial and streaming. All right, what about the second thing? Uh, don't accept the premise that it's okay to only know one layer. Students can understand more than one layer. In fact, I, I don't even know why I have to do this in Illinois because you, you know it from this, uh, for, what's it, 190? The course, yeah, it's the freshman course. Uh, so I say, what if we get rid of objects first? Start at the bottom, build up, keep building on what you understand. Uh, students don't understand objects. What they end up, they have no underpinnings. So what they end up doing is uh, memorizing. They try to look at the pattern that used the object and memorize that pattern and hope that they, the example you ask them in the exam or the program accommodates that thing that they memorized. And it isn't learning. What if we start with what Professor Patel and I call motivated bottom up, which is that you first motivate at a high level. Because if you start at the bottom and there's no context, the students have trouble uh, focusing on it. And they say, why am I bothering to do this? So you start at the high level. You just tell them what it's all about. And then you go down to a lower level. And you tell them what it's all about. And now you start and you teach them what's going on. And you teach them. And you take a level of abstraction that they all understand. What we do is we start with the, uh, the transistor as a light switch. Switch level behavior of a transistor. Kids have known how to do that since they were, in the second, since they were two years old. Boom, light goes on. Boom, light goes off. And then you build. And then you raise the level of abstraction, and then you build, and then you raise, and then you build. Motivate a bottom up. If we start with motivated bottom up, students build on what they already know. They don't memorize, they grok, continually raising the level of abstraction. Abstraction is good. I made fun of it earlier. It's bad if you don't know what's going on underneath. But it's good if you do understand what's going on and you can keep building it because you increase, enhance the productivity the higher the level only works if you understand what's going on below. And the student sees the layers from the start, and the student can make the connections. And the layers get broken naturally, and so the kids are like the Microsoft developers where they understand the low level and they are a better programmer because they understand what's going on. So if we're willing to continue to pursue ILP, give the core, give the microarchitect the wherewithal to be able to do it, and if we're willing to break the layers, which is critical, and embrace parallel programming. And one thing that's, so I've, I've pushed this off a lot, uh, utilize more than one interface. So are all programmers dumb? No. Some programmers need help. They need a very high level of abstraction. One of the criticisms of the cell processor was that the programmers had to know the, a low level of abstraction, and most of them can't. And so Peter Hosty, the chief architect of the cell, he goes around and they beat them up all the time. Why do you make us understand what's going on at this low level? Now maybe he had the low level wrong. You know, this issue with, this, with, uh, with uh, private memories, for example. But there are programmers out there that when he comes into town to give a talk or to meet with a company, they shake his hand. They say, wow, thank you for giving me the low level because the low level allows me to really make the hardware hum. I have a friend who uh, deals with these DNA strings, and uh, she uses the, uh, the GPU chip, and you know, you've talked to her, and she says, don't ever keep the low level from me, because I understand how a GPU works, and I can write algorithms that run much, much faster because I know the underlying hardware. So more than one interface, an interface for people who don't get it, and an interface for people who do get it, and if we're willing to understand more than our own layer. Then we'll be ready to harness the, uh, the resources of tomorrow's processor. Whoops, I'll back up. So, a couple of slides on the microprocessor of the future. 50 billion transistors means 50 billion, ridiculous number. We can have a huge number of simple cores uh, that uh, you know, we, don't even, not, we don't, even don't know how to use them all. 
we'll have so many of them. And still have a few heavyweights. In our own research, we've discovered that one heavyweight is the wrong answer. You need more than one. Uh, for example, you want the heavyweight core to work on the critical section because the other threads are waiting for this thread to get through with the critical section. The problem is you have more than one independent critical section. So a couple of heavyweights can uh, improve because if you don't have a couple of heavyweights, while one uh, thread is working on the critical section, another thread that has an independent critical section has this false dependency because it's waiting for the one heavyweight thread, uh, heavyweight core. So it's clear to me we need more than one, and that's, uh, we're doing that. And plenty of refrigerators for handling the specialized tasks. And multiple interfaces so the programmer who can will be able to exploit the low-level interface. So the future will be a multi-core chip. It'll be one of these Pentium X Niagara Y chips, multiple interfaces. Uh, we need to tackle off-chip bandwidth, that's clear. Uh, and power consumption, my view is, our on-off switches that are directed by the compiler. Uh, soft errors have to be dealt with, so every chip will be an internally fault-tolerant chip. Security I haven't even talked about, that's perhaps one of the most important problems today. And it will contain a few heavyweight processes with lots of refrigerators and levels of transformation integrated and multiple interfaces. Here's the heavyweight processor with a whole bunch of things that I don't have time to get into, but we can deal with this uh, with questions if you wish. And very importantly, I gave a keynote at a conference and some programmer took offense and uh, he said I was calling programmers dumb. And I wasn't calling programmers dumb. I was recognizing the fact that there are people that need help and people who don't need help. And by the way, it's a tough software problem because what you guys have to do is provide that help for those who need the help. But don't obliterate that low-level interface for those who don't need it. And so very importantly, at least two interfaces, one and the other, and most importantly, uh, software to help those who don't. And I'm done. Hey. All right. So now that uh, Yale finished about over an hour and a half early, um, we have a few uh, time for a few questions. Yes, Steve. You said we have to tackle the off-chip the bandwidth problem. How will that be tackled? So the question is, how do we tackle the off-chip bandwidth question, uh, problem? Uh, yeah, so if I, uh, so, um, So let me, uh, let me back it up a little bit. Uh, so there are two parts to going off chip. There's uh, latency and there's bandwidth. And um, uh, what people normally ask about is latency. You didn't, to your credit. Uh, and it turns out that uh, latency is not an issue until we've solved the bandwidth problem. So I want to get that out of the way first, because the bandwidth problem is about pins. And uh, uh, when you run out of, so the way you tackle latency, so we have these things, caches, et cetera, and so we prefetch. Well, how do we prefetch? We need to do something early. If we don't have the pin bandwidth, then we can't prefetch. I mean, prefetching does no good, if you will. So it's, uh, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the bandwidth problem. Uh, do I even have a good uh, answer for that? Uh, one answer, so, so one answer is, um, why is it that the, so what exacerbates the uh, chip bandwidth, one thing that exacerbates the chip bandwidth problem is the size of the, uh, the cache line. So when you take a miss, you go off chip, bring in a cache line. Uh, Dick Seitz, when he got through with, with designing the 21064, uh, and then he would say, okay, well, let me, let me uh, just look around at performance issues, and he measured the 21164. Now, the 21164 was a full wide issue machine. 
and he looked at the performance that that chip was producing, he was able to retire one instruction every four cycles. So the capability of the chip is four instructions each cycle, the delivery was one instruction every four cycles, it's a factor of 16 to one. It's running at 6% performance. And so the question he asked, why? So the answer was because the chip is spending most of its time doing cache refills of information that it's never using. So you take a cache miss, you bring in a line, you use 10% of that line, and then you kick it out. So there's two possibilities. One, in fact, uh, Phil Emma at IBM Research uh, calls it the trailing edge effect. That is, when you go to the memory to bring in a cache line, you get that first bus cycle, you get a piece of the line. And then you get all these other cycles where you're chewing up bandwidth, bringing in the rest of the line that doesn't get used. So one is, uh, can we do something at the algorithm or data set level so that when we bring in a cache line, we actually use it? Uh, secondly, can we do something about the size of the cache line? In fact, uh, if you look at a chip and you look at the caches, it's interesting that if you want to know how big the cache line is, a, a good rule of thumb is look at how many data pins there are multiplied by four. Right? Four bus cycles to bring in that cache line. It's not a completely accurate, it, but there's so many cases that it's clear that the design thing was it should take four, cache, four bus cycles to bring in a cache line. How about if we make the cache line smaller? We save on bandwidth. How about if we deal with the problem with the algorithm layer? How about if the person writing the algorithm knows that if you design your code or a data set this way, then we save chip bandwidth? So that's one place. Uh, I don't have any other you know, good answers to that. Does not prevent me from raising the issue because you know, the real problem is if we don't raise the issue, then the problem's never gonna get no. Okay? No. Yeah. Okay. Cash? Uh, how do you envision that design and verification all have to be playing into this uh, Max Niagara Y design? How do you factor in the verification? So, you know, when I was your age, we had, uh, so we had N designers and uh, zero verification people. And then we got one verification person. And so as time goes by, the number of people that are working on verification keeps going up because the size of the problem gets, keeps getting worse. So I'm not sure where the, the, the question is coming from. If you're asking, should we have verification people talking to microarchitects and putting a fair amount of the energy into designing the logic to make it easier or more difficult to verify, then the answer is sure. That's not your question, uh, okay? No, I was, I was um, so when you mentioned the Pentium Max Niagara Y design, right. essentially you're, you're talking about putting different kinds of cores on the same chip. Exactly. Uh, different kinds of cores in their performance characteristics, not different kinds of cores in their ISA, but that's okay. For verification purposes, microarchitecture is what it's all about, so sure. So I'm still not sure that we're, we're if, you're, if you're asking me, uh, I've got different kinds, so let me, let me say that, yes. There are different kinds of cores in the sense that, in fact, that slide showed. The heavyweight core has all these attributes, the lightweight core has all these attributes. So we need to verify both. I'm not sure why that becomes a problem. You know, Unless you're saying we need twice as many people? I mean, I'll buy that, sure. So if you're gonna ver ah, so you're saying, maybe that's where you're coming from, that if we do one of the two extremes, that is the quad core, I've got them, they're all the same, address the verification problem. The Niagara, they're all the same, address the verification problem. Now I've got this thing which they're not all the same. How do I address the problem? Twice as many people working on it, okay? Yeah, uh, yeah, there is no free lunch. It's also the case you're going to have to verify the accelerators. Every accelerator on that chip has to be verified, right? Every piece of the, in fact, the, the, uh, the process, the, the, the chip is not just a core. How about the memory system? Yeah. 
In fact, uh, the work that's going on here at Illinois with this Rigel thing with a thousand cords, and you have a cache system that is different from the typical cache system, right? The coherency thing, for example, is very different. If that is in the chip, it has to be verified. Now, uh, verifying that is not the same as verifying the pipeline through the execution core. So it is already the case to verify the chip has multiple parts. It has a front end. It has a back end. Uh, it has uh, the middle end, the execution core. You know, all these things require verification. So uh, if you're saying, haven't I exacerbated the problem by having more different things, the answer is of course. But uh, so what? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, last question, Nettie. Last question. Right. Where? Go ahead. I'm sorry? When, when you claim ILP is not dead, or people claim ILP is dead, they're talking about the future. Uh, what you showed on the graph for the 55X, you're talking about what LP is going to be impacted. Not going into what actually constitutes, uh, constitutes the 55X. Where do you see or it may be, as Professor right. uh, Kumar would like to do, says, it's really. Uh, Seven times two point four. So uh, uh, let me repeat the question. Oh so yeah. No, no. So what do you, well, I, let me make it easier. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so what I think he's asking me is, uh, was Santa Ana right? Okay. You remember Santa Ana? Are you the only other person in the audience who remembers Santa Ana? Huh? But you know the quote. In fact, you probably know the quote exactly. Well, what's the quote? <laughs> what's the quote exactly? Because I'm going to butcher it. Okay. So the, the quote goes something like that if we don't pay attention to the lessons learned by history, we're doomed to repeat them in the future. I think your question is, how do we know that the successes of the past of getting this, let's say it is 50, let's say it's uh, 17x or whatever he's coming up with. If it is 17x, and that's, or, or 2.4 out of microarchitecture, if that is correct, how do we know that moving forward we're going to get another 2.4? That's your question, right? Which I... You think my Santa Ana analogy is a good one or not? It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> By the way, from Lometa, that is absolute overwhelming praise. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is we don't know. All right? We do know that the trace cache, as implemented already, was a disaster because it was done wrong. Uh, there are things out there. I mentioned the replay stuff that Lometa and Patel did several years ago. That might produce value. Uh, a better branch predictor would certainly produce value. But more importantly, my, my real answer is I don't know. That is, what's in this room is a lot of very creative young minds. And if you turn them loose, who knows what they're going to come up with. But if you tell them that it's dead, then you know what they're going to come up with. Nothing. They're going to spend all their time on uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, more and more cores and try to figure out how to use them. Now, it's not the case that we shouldn't be figuring out how to use more and more cores. There are two parts of the problem, as I tried to, you know, the, the parallel programming and to break the layers to uh, exploit performance. And if the microarchitects can talk to people below and talk to people above to get a better handle on what the accelerator should look like, what these performance enhancements should look like, then we have a chance. And, uh, you know, most of you, uh, you know, graduate students in their 20s, uh, your brains are still fertile. And I'm not just, I'm not, this is not a cop, this is not, not a cop out. It's saying that we, we have been successful. In fact, go back, to, so maybe I should do that. So I didn't spend as much time on the Moore's Law slide as I often do. I've been told for the last 40 years that Moore's Law is fine for today. But five years from now, it'll be dead. That is, we've reached the limit. And I've been hearing that every five years for the last 40 years. Moore's Law is okay right now, but five years from now, it's all over. And yet it hasn't been. And why? Because the process people, every time you hit the barrier, you think, and don't ever excuse, don't ever minimize the value of engineering ingenuity and they see a way through it, and it keeps on going. Our branch predictor, for example. Uh, we had a paper in ISCA 91, 
that said ILP can be greater than 2. It turns out there was a paper in ISCA the year before by some people at one of those fancy universities on the West Coast. And they said that ILP will never be greater than 1.85. And they showed you. They had the chip. They had a load store unit. They had an ALU. And they showed that it didn't matter what you did, you couldn't get better than 1.85. Actually, with two functional units, I thought they did damn good getting 1.85. You know. So where was it written? When Moses came down, he didn't say, thou shalt not have more than two functional units. Right? <laughs> that wasn't part of the, you know, what was on the tablet. You know, if he did come down. I don't know whether he did, but if he did. All right? uh, the point is that with our branch predictor, which you know, has you know, generated a lot of research in a lot of places, and in fact now the best branch predictors, I hardly recognize our two-level predictor in there. But the point is that people did not understand what you could get by having a good branch predictor. And then we came up with it, and then people built on it, and then all of a sudden you get, wow. So I don't know that moving forward we're going to be able to do what we've been able to do before, but I do know that if we don't say, hey, let's give more transistors to the cores, then we never will. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's a, a two-minute reception outside. If you have any more questions, uh, you know, feel free to ask Yale. But let's thank Yale one more time.